Here are five Botox mistakes that you're making on your older patients. These are five mistakes that I've made so that you don't have to. Let me share with you a story about a patient that I saw many years ago when I was just starting out. She was the owner of a business and she was referring patients to me and I gave her her first botulinum toxin treatment. And I knew she was a bit older, so I was a bit more careful. I put a bit less in and she got an enormous eyebrow lift, like the McDonald's sign. She was not happy. And I had to get her back in and treat her where I made the adjustment and then I gave her a brow drop. And I felt awful about this, but it also completely killed off any referrals I may have ever got. So this was a rookie mistake that I made. And in this episode, I'm gonna share with you things you should know so that you don't make the same mistake. First, let's discuss some of the important differences with the anatomy with older patients so that you can understand what is underpinning the difference between botulinum toxin in older and younger people. The biggest difference, of course, is a decrease in the fat distribution. Older people tend to lose fat in certain areas and increase fat in certain areas of the face, creating different dynamics. Combine that also with a decrease in collagen and elastin, you have a problem with support there's a decrease in the natural support of the skin, both underneath in terms of the fat pad, but also in terms of the skin itself. So let's consider what happens, particularly in the upper face with volume changes. If you look at an older patient's forehead, even if they are generally more overweight than average, they can often have very little fat in the forehead. And you can see the contour of the forehead. Now this means that the muscle underneath is unopposed by the fat pad. The elasticity in the skin is lower anyway, and it makes many of your treatments have a greater effect than you might actually anticipate. Not necessarily in terms of reducing wrinkles, but in terms of what happens to that muscle after the treatment. You can think of this generally as making the muscle more sensitive to botulinum toxin, even though the skin might be less sensitive to the end result. So the next mistake I made was not to assess the wrinkle properly. When you first start, you often go through a wave of thinking that botulinum toxin really can solve any problem if you've been treating your average patient which in our clinic has always been a 43-year-old female. So a 43-year-old, you can usually soften most of their lines within two to four weeks of a treatment. But that same patient, if they attend age 65, will have a different result. And that's simply because the lines are deeper. They may even have glycation, for example, on the skin, but other things that change the texture of the skin that diminish your result. So one of the simple things you can do to decrease the risk of overpromising is to always take your patient, whatever crease they're concerned about, and try and pull it apart simply with your fingers and see how well the skin unfolds. You can usually get a good indication how well that skin is going to recover when the muscle is relaxed. And typically, if the line remains, and particularly if there's a three-dimensional component to it, so you can actually feel the line, even though you're separating it with your fingers, you should be very pessimistic about what botulinum toxin can do for your patient in those situations. But always do the check. The next mistake is not realizing how common brow drops are and how they get exponentially more common as you get older. And this is because of the lack of other tissue supporting the skin. So in a younger patient, you can put a higher dose in and they have much more volume, usually stronger muscles, more elasticity in their skin. And this means you don't notice drops as easily. As soon as you have a patient who's lost even bone, muscle, fat, and muscle strength altogether, and then you do a low dose treatment, you'll often find that the brows slump down much more easily than they would on a younger patient. So as injectors, this means we have to be much more careful with smaller doses, more evenly distributed, and not particularly using the licensed doses, which I think are quite heavy handed. This is partly why there is no license for treatment over the age of 65. I think one of the reasons this happens with licenses is that they tend to put the effort into defining a cohort who they know will get benefit. And as you move out of the more common age group to have treatments, which is around 43, you tend to move into areas where there are more variables and it's more likely to get disappointing results. This does not mean that you cannot get great results with older patients. It just gets less likely the older they get. The next mistake many new injectors make is that you chase the line instead of understanding the anatomy. So older people have more lines and they will come back and ask you for top-ups in areas where a younger person won't simply because they don't have the lines. So when you have, for example, lines that run into the cheek, particularly the inferior part of it, this does not mean that you should treat those lines because they probably don't come from the orbicularis oculi muscle. They probably come from the zygomatic muscle. So you're either going to waste your product 
or even worse, you'll actually treat the zygomaticus major and end up with a slump in the cheek. There's also some cases where treating more laterally and more inferiorly, even though you may not be hitting the zygomaticus major muscle, the effect it has on the SMAS in that area can create a saggy appearance. So we want to be very careful with chasing lines in older people. Most of the time, even if you improve the line, you end up with another side effect because muscles support the whole structure of the face. I'll give you one other example, which is the orbicularis oculi, which is an accessory muscle to cheek elevation. If you look at a person doing a broad smile, you will see that the orbicularis oculi muscle actually pulls up their cheek. It also smooths over the transition between the cheek and the lower lid junction, creating a smoother contour. So as soon as you completely relax that muscle, you get the ledge that forms, which most of you have probably spotted already in some of your patients, but you can also get a rather sad looking smile because the cheek is not being pulled up in the way that it normally would. Number five is to remember that the volume of the muscle is also part of what makes people look a certain age. So if you shrink the volume of muscle, you can make people look older. Probably the best or potentially the worst example would be to shrink the masters in an older person. If you do a master reduction procedure with botulinum toxin in a 55 year old with a slight jowl, what unfortunately can happen is the loss of volume allows the whole of the jowl to slip forward, causing a new crease. Now, I saw this once with one of my patients who had bruxism. I treated her and she came back with a new medial fold. My first instinct when she booked the appointment was that she was dysmorphic. But when I saw her a couple of weeks later, I realized I had actually caused enough of a depletion in the volume to allow her skin to move forward. And I corrected that by putting dermal filler back into the place where the master had been reduced. Now, it's not an ideal situation. It's way better not to do that procedure because it's very expensive to fix. And also it means that the bruxism treatment is probably not something you'd want to continue with. But it does tell you some interesting stuff about the dynamic of the skin and the muscle in the face, which is very useful for you to design your own treatment plans. And finally, a bonus tip. Think about the face as you get older as a balancing act that gets harder and harder. The older someone gets, the bigger the difference a single unit can make. So if you treat, for example, the middle of the forehead and, and leave the side untreated, you're going to get a much bigger Spock brow effect. So more likely get a medial brow drop and a lateral brow lift in an older person than in a younger person. Similarly, if you treat even a glabella area, it's more likely that that will cause a brow drop because there's just less support there. So what this means as an injector is that you need to create treatment plans that have greater variability between patients. You effectively have to design things more carefully. This means smaller doses in more places. So if you're treating a frontalis muscle, I wouldn't be doing four units times three. I'd more likely separate each of those four injections into one unit and spread it more evenly, taking into account that there's gonna be a much easier line to discern between treated and untreated muscle and to feather those in more carefully. You also may wanna start with low doses wherever you are, even though the patient thinks they need more because they have deeper lines. Because we know that underneath that is a muscle that if over-treated can cause drops and heaviness and sagginess. And if under-treated, at least you can add more later on. In summary, take your time, be more careful and learn each patient's face before you build up to your normal doses. If you'd like to learn more about how to create a brow lift on older patients, make sure you watch this video, which I'll link at the end of the show.